I'm just gonna let y'all gather in here. And while y'all are falling in, I am just going to take a few minutes to introduce Sheila Patty O'Brien here that you can see on our screen. So I am Skylar with Lean Frontiers and I will be your host for today. If you have time, if we have time at the end of today's webinar, we will be taking questions. If we are unable to address the questions at the end, you can contact the presenter directly. This webinar is being recorded, so please allow us 24 to 48 hours to process the link for the recording. As you can see, I've already introduced her, but this is Sheila Patty O'Brien on the screen. Patty has had a career at all levels of government and numerous nonprofit organizations. Her last 17 plus years have been focused on working with organizations to improve the way they do their work. Improvements have led to decreased costs and enhanced positive reputations. Her work has covered a range of organizations in the corporate, educational, governmental, and nonprofit sectors. She has conducted over 30 improvement workshops and developed over 15 classroom trainings. She is the author of Lean for the Nonprofit, what you don't know can cost you, and most recently, facilitating rapid. With that, I will hand it over to Sheila and she will take over. Hello, everyone. Um, I can't really, I don't see everyone, but let's go ahead and start the slideshow. Um, one of the reasons that I developed my manual and this is where the change it up title comes from, is that I thought there were opportunities for uh, us to evolve from the traditional way of doing rapid process improvement workshops and Kaizen events. And I also thought it was a way that we could highlight um, the need for professional continuous education um, in LEAN. So, and the third thing is, is that I want you to be assured that one size does not fit all. So this is an attempt to make uh, Lean be streamlined for government and nonprofits. And, and the next slide speaks to my, um, next Skylar, uh, speaks to my concern about continuous professional education. You know, the CPAs and our MDs, our doctors, both of their organizations require courses for them to keep up their learning from year to year. And so I thought that was an excellent idea. And because after we practice our craft for a couple of years, um, it seems to me that we are left to our own devices. And we need other places to go, not just um, advanced tools training. Next. So what I wanna do is show you uh, what's in my manual. There's um, a table of contents, of course, and you'll see how that's laid out. The table of contents is very familiar to many problem solving steps, but you'll see some differences. Um, I also will call out the dual role of the facilitator. We forget that as facilitators, we are keeping our eye on the big picture, and yet we are trying to move the team through the specific steps in the workshop. Um, there are many lessons learned in this manual uh, based on true experience from um, people who've been working in government who have successfully completed rapid process improvement workshops. And it also includes original documents. So you can see how someone filled out a document that sits on an RPI team. Within this manual, there are newly created tools and um, they were created out of necessity as I started thinking about ways uh, that our path in doing a workshop could be innovative. Next. <clears throat> so here's the manual, Rapid Process Improvement Workshops. Uh, it's a self-study guide. And for those of you who may not be familiar with what rapid process improvement means, 
it's very similar to Kaizen, a blitz, an accelerated um, improvement event. But the intention is that its improvements are analyzed and implemented quickly. <laughs> um, and we can go into the details about how that gets done later. But it has a, staff, a work team made up of staff who are the frontline workers. <laughs> And it also has a trained facilitator. This is called rapid because everything happens within three to five days. Next, <clears throat> um, I know that, let me just point out some of this. These are the questions that came to me as I thought about the next steps in continuous improvement. Do I know the critical junctures or decisions in a workshop? That was something I had to learn. Um, do I know when to pull back the team when they need to do more work? You know, the team is so enthusiastic. They're out there, but they come back with what they have and they don't have enough data. So I have to send them back out. Um, do I know when teams are too big? Well, sometimes the ideal team number uh, span of control is uh, eight to 12 people. If you get above that, you know, it's very hard for you as a facilitator to manage them. So when we have certain activities to do or they need to analyze something in the workplace, I break them up into many teams. And as the workshop progresses, am I able to start writing the final report in my head? And I think the reason this is important is that I always advise in my uh, art of facilitation essays that you document the work of the day, <laughs> that you record it that night, um, and things will come to you that you will highlight and bring forward. And that will be the basis of some of the writing of your report. So next, this is a navigation path of how I would innovate facilitating a workshop. As you can see at the beginning, it's pretty much introduction, understanding the state, goes on through the steps, and finally to a report out in continuous improvement. So if we look at the uh, table of contents on the next, page, we'll see that there are much more details to these. But one of the things I want to point out is there are really uh, two parts of improvements to this workshop. And chapter three is the first improvements is really the traditional way that we address waste and clean up the current process. And then if you get <clears throat> to five, six, seven, and eight, that's the whole um, second set of improvements as I think about as the document or the person works their way through the steps in the flow. Next. <clears throat> Next. Oh, hold on, it's trying. Maybe, there we go. Okay, so, um, so here we are again at the path and I wanted to point out uh, the two roles. Uh, as you can see, the helicopter view and the Jeep on the ground view. Two very different things, but you are toggling as a facilitator uh, between them. And um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Next, one of the um, things that I wanted to share with you that I learned is there are many abstract lean terms that you say them and you don't really know if people really understand them and that concerned me. So things like the term value, the term flow. So one of the things that I used was to show a picture of what that term is not. <laughs> so you can see this is, there is no flow of traffic in this picture. And to the teams, it, it just brought it home for them. They just understood it a little better. So I would say just, I caution you against using the lingo. And if you do, make sure that it's understandable. <clears throat> um, 
let me go on to the next slide, which talks about the new tools I developed. Now, um, this is a chart about data collection approaches. There are many people in government who may not have um, statistical sampling. They don't know uh, much about complex tools, but the people on the teams for Kaizen only really need to know these very simple, which I call data collection approaches. And you can see there are three arms. There's existing data, there is creating data from surveys and creating data from feedback. Uh, many times, unfortunately, in my experience, we go to interview the director of the organization in which we are doing the workshop and either they are so overwhelmed with data and, that they um, don't use it or when we ask for certain data like how much is coming into your organization every day they really don't know so that's when I move to we have to collect our own data so from surveys or feedback. Um, the other thing that I put in this next um, slide is I wanted to share with you how I configured where we start with the workshop. I think the first thing we're always taught in training is, is we get these big lists of waste. And for me, I kept saying, what do we do with them? Where are they? Um, I don't know about your training, but it just sort of hung up there in the air. So it made me think very seriously how I was going to have to handle um, the, the notion of waste and its value. Because I did learn next, if you see in this government food stamps needed slide, this is a food stamp processing center. And it's very confused. There are a lot of things going on. And I didn't know how to identify from the waste list, from a manufacturing viewpoint into a government process like food stamps. But I'm gonna show you how I um, adapted that. So if we go on to the next slide, I wanna show you, um, two pictures that helps explain the two categories of improvement. When we are making improvements, um, we are much like in the first part, pruning a tree. Um, when you talk about the waste, you know, uh, an arborist wants to get out of the overgrowth, uh, wants to take out um, all the dead wood, wants to allow those roots to go deep so there can be new growth. So I use this picture, this metaphor of pruning a tree uh, to represent the first part of improvements. Uh, the second figure, which we'll talk more in detail, is a picture of a roundabout, because I wanted to talk about the second aspect of improvements, which is smoothing out the flow and all the aspects of that. And it made me think about if you've ever driven through a roundabout, it's not a four-way stop. Everything keeps going the best it can. So next, <clears throat> here's the line uh, that I have on the pathway. And you could see that uh, on the left is where we're going to be cleaning up the process. And on the right are all the steps for smoothing out the flow. Um, this will be important uh, later on when uh, after the fourth step, we may want to change some directions in the agenda of the workshop. So <clears throat> the first part of improvements next, as I said, is uh, really removing waste or what I call unnecessary steps. And many of you may use this, but it's basically to have the team go through each step and identify it as whether it's waste, um, i.e. not necessarily, whether it has value, um, or whether or not it's necessary. 
Now, you may ask, how do they have uniform questions about determining that? And uh, so after I had done this exercise a couple times, I went and developed the next tool. If you go on next to the next slide, this is the questions, the right questions to ask. I know it's small, but in the first column, each you would ask this, each question about each step, you would get an answer what to do for yes, and answer what to do for no, and about what the action is. Um, Skylar, would you please just read a part of that? Mm -hmm. Does this step physically change the product or service going through the process? keep the step in the process. For example, this means someone touched it and wrote on it, separated it or attached it to something, whether it didn't just sit idle. That, that's great. It just gives you a flavor of sort of uh, how we standardize uh, this activity. One of the things that came about in this activity is that you can imagine team members may disagree with each other, um, especially in one workshop where I was looking at the Older Americans Act funds allocation process. And there were several county uh, field offices of the Agency on Aging. This was a very, very uh, important RPI. So finding out what the regulations really said was really important. So if you go on to the next slide, when one of the staff members, Skylar, <clears throat> if one of the staff members said, I think that is really necessary, Somebody say, no, it really isn't. There's wiggle room. So I always say, check your source documents. Let's go back and read it. Um, and of course, this is, this is a source document, the federal policy. Um, and indeed, when the team went to look at it, it read totally different than being cut and dry um, as a regulation. There was some uh, flexibility in it, and that was important to know. And next, the second set of improvements has to do with smoothing out the flow. If you think about, I don't know how many of you have written, written driven through a roundabout, um, things go con constantly. Um, there is a pace to the cars. There are signs that say yield. Uh, people know when they have to enter the process. So, so think about that. Those are all aspects of lean. Um, and this is how we want the process to go smoothly through. But this is how we want the, the document, excuse me, document, person, product to go through our own process. So in the next set of improvements, what I have done is said, we're smoothing out the flow. And we have developed different parts of these improvements into categories that represent the different parts of the process. Many times teams have come to me and said at the end, I don't know where we've done all of this root cause analysis, we've done all the testing. Uh, we're a little confused about exactly where this improvement takes place. So for that reason, I've divided up the steps as you go on to the next slide and we'll look closely at the path. And you could see on the other side of the blue line. We're gonna improve the workflow as it comes in. We're gonna improve the workflow going through. We're gonna improve the work methods and we're going to improve, which is often left out, process supports. Uh, the, um, what I call the materials, um, the equipment, the environment. Um, let's go on to the next slide and let's delve down to one chapter. 
Um, just to show you how this came about, what I noticed um, in my RPIs is that many people in the organizations did not know about what was coming in, the amount of it, um, how much they were able to get through. Um, and this was, this was concerning to me. And I also observed that they didn't know the kinds of work coming in. And what I mean by that, many times we got into a, a workshop and there were different kinds of applications coming in. There wasn't just one. And we got ready to do a flowchart and we soon discovered that and had to, um, had to back up. The other thing that I learned was there were many different points of entry for documents to come into the process. Some of the points of entry were even in other buildings that had to be transferred to the main building. Uh, points of entry like coming in on faxes, uh, dropped off attachments to emails. This was really important to know because if you didn't know all that, you didn't have all of the data that you needed. And th the other thing that I noticed was there was a great mix up of what is simple to do and what is complex to do. So somebody who would be standing in a line, say for one of our field offices, would be coming there uh, to do probably two main things, to drop something off or to wait for an appointment. And yet, all these different kinds of tasks were in one line. And of course it was long. So if we had a, a way to sort out that work at the front, um, things would flow in the steps following that. Um, next, I wanna show you one of the tools that I use. Remember I talked about uh, many applications coming in. Um, and those of you who have seen this uh, product family chart, well, I adapted it to the licensing and certification process of our state nurse, nurse process, nurse licensing process. Um, and the team and I um, didn't know the extent, we knew a few of them, but if you look down the left side, those acronyms, and as you can see, RN is nurse, are all the different kinds of nursing applications for certifications that come in. And, and across the top are the main steps that the, that the staff goes through uh, to check that uh, application. And it goes all the way down. You can see the licensed LPNs. Um, they have five steps, um, CNS, you may be familiar with that. Um, you may ask why was this important to do? Because people came to me and said, wait a minute, do we have to do a process flow, flow chart and analysis of each one of these um, different kinds of applications? And uh, I knew looking at the clock, that we did not have time in the RPI to do that. So this came in handy because um, I'm sure you could probably guess what they see. Um, the RN is the process that was picked because it covered the most steps of everyone else. So if we improve that, we touched on the other processes. Um, and then for those that, that um, needed some customization or anything else could be added to that. But the standardization of the RM process could be used by all the other certifications, applications. <clears throat> um, like next, like the long lines, um, this is how I think about controlling the demand. You know, the grocery store figured out how to do an express line. <laughs> for people who didn't have very many items. And so that's what I'm saying about separating out the comp complex work that's coming in from the simple work. Many organizations decided to um, appoint um, a gatekeeper. 
you know, it's much like the concierge when you go into the Apple store or Verizon, when they ask, what do you need? Um, and they're separating out the work right there. So that's an example of that. Next, if we jump back to our tool roles, <clears throat> um, I really want to show you first some examples about the Jeep view. And uh, but first, first, that's what happens in the detailed steps. But first, I want to show you uh, a couple of things, steps that I added in here to the big picture. If you see Oh, let, let's go on, excuse me, I just looked ahead. Let's go on, this is the specific Jeep view, apologies. This is a page from the manual. I know it's um, very small, but it's a typical page. Remember, this is a self-study guide and this is how it's set up. Uh, you have instructions for the facilitator of what to do. And in this case, um, draw simple process, process flow of flip chart and there's a little logo and then an example of what to draw. And if you go down, it gives the facilitator time to digest what's going on and what to say. So there's a suggestion of saying, say this in your own words. Um, the italics at the bottom are the coaching notes, lessons learned. Um, they're in italics and within parentheses, and this is all throughout the manual. This one says, many times the team may not be clear about exactly what defines a process. Help them out by saying it is repetitive, not just a one-time task, and is made up of sequential step-to-step -step activities. Um, I don't know about you, but one of the things that I emphasize right up front is to get the team into process thinking <laughs> um, because we will be coming back to that again and again. Okay, let's go back um, to the next slide, which is, this is what I wanted to show you, was the two steps that I included called a pause step. Um, there's a pause at chapter four, which is a workshop quality check. And then there's a pause at chapter nine. And it's what I call, how do I land this 747? Let me tell you about that. It is time that needs to be put in and formalized about how you gather all, all the data, all the observations uh, from the team, um, all the charts, all the decisions about to put all of this information into a succinct oral presentation for management at the end. And there's a, there's a way to do that, that I figured out because you could get lost in, in all the details. Um, it also sets you up for writing the entire report, which I write within a week after the workshop. Now, if we go on to the second pause, this is where I say we do a quality check. Um, I certainly think it's appropriate for a lean workshop um, to do a quality check. And what I noticed is by this time after the team has done their step-by-step -step analysis, I, I look at them and there is some doubt in their eyes that I see. And uh, what comes out is they have uh, been showing this initial charger at the beginning and it has goals on it. <laughs> and, and now that the team is well into the workshop and they know more about the process, they may start having doubts that they can do all of this within the time uh, allowed. So um, they voice, I call in the author of the charter, the sponsor, um, to talk to the team about this. And there are some times when 
the sponsor will adjust the goals, particularly if you ask the sponsor, how did they derive the goals? And um, invariably, um, they may have, it may have been done randomly, uh, which gives me pause and uh, helps me discuss further with the sponsor about perhaps we can't really, in the time given, uh, decrease, increase revenue by 50% in the first month, but maybe in the second or third month. So it's reviewing the charter. This pause also gives us in the next slide, a way to say, do we have to do five days in the workshop? And this has come up many times for me. And once you get into the workshop, you know, the solution to the problem becomes really obvious. So why would I direct the team to spend time in doing all the detailed uh, tools that we were taught in the traditional way of doing a Kaizen. So I develop a matrix. This has four quadrants. This is just a partial matrix. And it talks about whether or not that the process is a low complexity and is the solution known or non unknown. And low complexity and high complexity. And let me just say that the, the quadrant has, depending on which, which they choose, I have um, suggested certain tools need to be used to substantiate whatever actions or recommendations they come up with it. And it's, it's the tools that we have been taught all the way from doing just a flow chart and analyzing what's waste, all the way to a robust uh, five day RPI. So that's a new tool that's put into it. Next, <clears throat> one of the last chapters that I have put into the book was um, a bonus because many people, I don't know how many of you have something like this to help you, asked me about how do you prepare for the RPI? So in my learnings, I set out guidelines uh, according to six weeks, from the event all the way to the day of the event. And I distinguish roles of the team, the facilitator, management, and, and the sponsor. So it's all de detailed in that way for you. It's really, um, the manual really is a soup to nuts. <laughs> and if you go in summary to the next slide, you will see that uh, there are many things in the manual I didn't touch on. One is um, I added a chapter called The End of the Story. If you were to read that, you would see uh, the question about what did we learn and how did we do? So it basically says to the reader, uh, reviews, okay, this is what we learned and this is what we did. And it builds on that to go to the second chapter and then to the third chapter. The other thing that's in the book, as you know, is um, the questionnaire tool that's in the back of there and how to collect data, which are the two new tools that I showed you. But also um, I've added another thing. And next, if you, See, I've added many essays called The Art of Facilitation, and it really is lessons learned. This one has to do with how I learned to review each day. I think I pointed that out early. There's an Art of Facilitation essay about unions. Uh, there's an Art of Facilitation about tack time in government and the challenge of that. And Next, there is also appendices at the end of each chapter. There are handouts for you to copy. And then there are instructions for you as a facilitator to take the team through certain activities. Now, one overall comment about this manual is that 
it really is for the facilitator to read and study. Um, there are self-study editions to the appendix. For instance, I think it's really important to understand what processes are in your organization and, and to list them and to list them by um, the title of it and who's the process owner. And, you know, there are, there's an organization um, and I show an example in the book of how a city government lists their processes. Um, this is important because it gives uniformity and standardization um, to helping improve the work in the organization and um, to focus, you know, on what we come up with in our workshop. There are many um, handouts because I choose not to do a PowerPoint presentation. Um, I use flow charts, flip charts for you to look at and draw on and have the team to use and to look at and then to have copies of handouts. Um, and I may show one of those, um, but basically it's not to get bogged down in PowerPoints. It, it's really a facilitator to facilitator book. And, you know, hopefully to answer those questions that I had in the beginning. Um, what about those next steps in your learning? What about those subtleties, the nuances and the things um, nobody tells you till you run into a problem. And so the purpose really of the manual is to shortcut your time uh, of learning. So uh, we're getting to the end here. And I wanna say thank you and very much. And we're gonna take questions. And um, in case any of you are interested, these are the sites uh, to my, to the manual, which is coming out at the end of May. And then um, the second side is for uh, lean process for the nonprofit. And you can reach me through LinkedIn and I'm sure Skylar can get that to you. So I'm happy to have any of you contacting me. Um, by the way, I wanna take time to tell you that I answered in writing all the questions that were submitted by you prior to this. And I believe Skylar, you put them in a link in the chat. Is that right? I am sending the link out right now in the chat. There is also, oh, I will let you tell Addie about your webinar. Oh, I can answer those. Uh, let me let me just talk. Well, one of the questions that came in is, how did you have the team identify the high level steps in nurse licensing and certification process since there were multiple types of applications? This is a great question. And um, let me explain what I did in um, an RPI that had three different field offices that were doing the same process, but they were all doing it differently. <laughs> and, and as they did their flowcharts, they put them up and I thought, oh my gosh, that flowchart has 39 steps, that flowchart has 18, and that flowchart has 10. How am, I get the, how am I going to get them to unify so that they can agree on best standard practices? So I asked them to put those up and I thought, we have got to boil these down to the essential tasks. And the team has to agree what are the essential tasks are. And it's sort of like a value stream, if you call it, a macro flow chart. And they were able to agree on this has to be done, this has to be done, this has to be done. Now, um, as an aside, what did I do next? I asked them to put the best practice that they had underneath each one of those. And that's how we got to some standard work. Um, if, you, if you contact me, we can talk more about it. But it's basically, and this is a real challenge in facilitation, how do you take all this detail, bring it back up, and then bring it back down without losing the essential steps? 
Um, I missed the part about the Older Americans Act. How are you incorporating RPI? I work with senior services. Um, the Older Americans Act um, is a federal act that, get, that gives money to states to uh, dispense to uh, local offices called uh, American Ages Agencies on Aging Americans, AAA. <clears throat> so each one of these field offices gets an allocation of their funds. Well, there was great complaints <laughs> one year about the allocation process and they asked for a rapid process improvement to investigate how this um, decision making of this process came about. And um, indeed, that's how we worked an RPI into it. And so we would lay out how uh, the process uh, for making a decision about allocation, um, we laid that out in big steps. And then we went through the step-by-step -step analysis. And um, okay, I, I hope I hope I answered you, but please continue. Um, I'm going to leave this back to you, Skylar. Okay, so um, as you all should be able to see, there is a link there in the chat feature. Um, I will also, when the recording is done, give us about 24 to 48 hours for this to get processed. I will send a link to view the recording as well as this link that I sent the chat um, directly to the questions that Patty did answer for all of y'all. Um, if you have any questions, you can direct them directly to me or to Patty. If you want to send them to me, I can forward them on to Patty um, and copy you on those. Other than that, thank you all for participating today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much, Patty, for facilitating our webinar. Everybody have a great day and we will see you next time. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, Patty.